ultimately still making a totally collaborative effort. So it's like, you know, things are changing throughout the process of filming and that there's dialogue in there that, you know, we ad libbed and improvised day of that, you know, made the final picture. So, you know, I, I think it's important to not be hyper sacred to what's on the, the written page and know that it's a dynamic that can change. Hey folks, Brian Smith here with DreamPath Podcast, where we get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. Today we talk to Michele Civeta. Michele is a writer, a producer, and director. He has directed commercials for companies like Coca-Cola, Martini and Rossi, Dunkin' Donuts. He actually received an Emmy nomination for his commercial work in 2016. He's also directed music videos for Yoko Ono, uh, Lou Reed, one of my personal favorites, Sparkle Horse, a lot of great bands. And he's just fantastic in that medium. And he also directs feature films. Um, his uh, 2019 feature film was Agony, starring Asia Argento. And his most recent film is The Gateway, starring a star-studded cast of uh, Shea Wiggum, who plays a down-and-out social worker. Uh, Frank Grillo plays a gangster. Taryn Manning, Mark Boone Jr., and Bruce Dern, um, one of the all-time greatest actors, character actors uh, ever. And uh, what a wonderful cast he's put together with this film. But going back to the down and out social worker premise, this is a crime thriller. It's a noir crime thriller, I should say. And Shea Wiggum plays the social worker who is trying to protect his client from a maniacal drug dealer. And he does a great job. The music's fantastic. And there's a lot of uh, action and tension. And it's just a, a lot of fun. And I love crime thrillers. I love noir. And McKelly did a great job with this film. So I'm really excited to see where his career goes after this. He was very generous to share um, a lot of things in a short interview with us, including advice for filmmakers, how he got into the arts, and um, the challenges that he faced while shooting this film, what went into casting this film, and uh, how he approached rewriting the script. There's just a lot of fun things that we covered in a short period of time. So I hope you enjoy this chat as much as I did. So let's jump right into my chat with Michele Civeta. Hi, good morning, Brian. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well, Michele Civeta. Welcome to Dream Path Podcast. Hey, my pleasure to be uh, with you today. Like all the guitars behind you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I am. Uh, I, this backdrop for me is um, just a way to kind of break the ice sometimes with creatives. It, it seems to. <laughs> be a conversation starter, but, uh, boy, what a film. Uh, I just watched this, uh, movie of yours, the gateway, and we're here to talk about it, um, and your career. So thanks for making time for us. Maybe you could start by sharing, um, you know, I guess your elevator description of this movie and, um, you know, for, for my audience who obviously haven't seen it yet, because it's not going to be released until the third, I believe. That's right. The uh, film's coming out this weekend on uh, Friday the 3rd. Uh, so The Gateway is basically an inner-city crime thriller. Um, I like to think of it as a bit of a neo-noir. And it basically follows a social worker, uh, played by Shea Wiggum, who gets enmeshed in a family that he's trying to protect, uh, who had um, a husband who was an ex-convict who's uh, released from prison early, uh, and basically sets off a whole travail into uh, um, drug smuggling and uh, drug heist and basically puts all the uh, characters' lives in jeopardy as everybody kind of intertwines. Um, along the way, <clears throat> basically, all the, all the characters have to uh, come to grips with their own troubled past. And um, ultimately, I think it's a story of redemption that, you know, kind of uh, people find the, their core humanity along the way as they, they discover. Wow, that's a great synopsis. Um, <laughs> so... It based upon my research, it looks like this screenplay has been around for a while. It was blacklisted, or was on the blacklist, yeah. I should say, not blacklisted. It was on the blacklist in 2013, I believe. That, that, that's correct. Um, I was uh, not aware of uh, the scripting on the blacklist until recently, actually. But my hmm. producer, uh, Andrew Levitas, had, had basically discovered the script, I guess, optioned it a bunch of years back. Um, and he'd asked me, you know, look, if 
you can take a crack at the script and we can develop it to a place that it's a little bit more nuanced and has you know kind of greater uh, character arcs, a little bit more development, and uh, what will be you know in, in shape to actually go make this thing as a picture. Um, so you know from from the original script, it had an amazing uh, all the building blocks and architecture of a really solid uh, genre piece. And you know what I like to believe we did along the way was basically infuse a few more human elements and, and create a bunch of different characters. So it became a little bit more socio political in terms of what was being said. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of uh, both the arc of characters as, as well as just about the world in general at this point. Was Shea Wiggum's character, uh, Parker, a social worker when you got the script originally, or did that evolve? Yeah, no, absolutely. He was a social worker. And, you know, I think to uh, tip my hat to the original script, I, I thought it was such a unique way to, to kind of uh, investigate and kind of get dug into your kind of typical cops and robbers kind of uh, story, you know, in a sense, like it's not a vantage point that we're, we're really used to seeing our, our hero, hero kind of like uh, coming from in terms of how they travail kind of the rough and tumble world that, that the story occupies. Yeah. I found it fascinating to see this crime world through the lens of a social worker's eyes. Um, because with like the, the typical trope of, the um, protagonist in a movie like this is the cop or, yeah. you know, the ex cop or, you know, maybe ex military or something like that. But here, you know, there's a softer side to him. There's a, a damaged side, obviously <clears throat> working through some trauma. And um, so he's not the, this guy that you know is going to come in guns a blazing and be able to just manhandle his way through the situation. He's got to use a different uh, skill set. Yeah, um, no, you're, so. you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it has all the conventions of what we're used to, but like, you know, even in rewriting the script, it became so important to justify why can this guy actually be uh, a little bit more aggressive as a uh, social worker. And so, you know, I wrote in the whole backstory of him as a like failed boxer and, and just how all that stuff played out that, you know, you got the sense that this was a tough guy, especially when he comes up against some <laughs> legitimate looking tough guys, you know? Right. And talking about the the legitimacy of this, these tough guy characters, I mean, you really brought in some great actors to fill these roles. Frank Grillo. Thank you. Um, Shea Wiggum and Frank Grillo, both, for me, visually, uh, almost, and this, this is not meant to be disparaging in any way, but they almost, mm-hmm. they're so distinctive, they look like comic book characters sometimes. <laughs> like... Just yeah. their facial expressions and chiseled, like, like iconic looking kind of guys. We've exactly. Iconic is a great word for both of them. Uh, but how did the casting come about for Grillo and Wiggum and, and, and the rest of them? Because it was very well cast in my opinion. Oh, thank you. I, uh, you know, we started to send the script around and it's always a chicken versus the egg kind of proposition in terms of getting these things off the ground. But we were real fortunate because we sent it to Shay and he, he responded pretty early on. And he and I kind of developed a lot, a lot of components of the character kind of while we were casting. And, uh, you know, ultimately Shay, as I've been saying, is like the ultimate insider actor's actor. So I think, you know, when somebody sees he's involved with something, they know it's going to be a heartfelt piece, but it's going to be about, you know, visceral, raw, real acting. And so, uh, you know, it, it really made everything a lot easier in terms of that as an anchor, in terms of the cosmology of what the story was going to be. But from there we had Olivia Munn got uh, involved <clears throat> and, you know, uh, part of my, my goal, I guess, in trying to orchestrate, you know, a, a comprehensive world was just to really be uh, very, disparaging about making sure every single character really lived up to, you know, what their screen time could be. So we got super lucky with Frank Grillo coming out to play ball and Mark Boone Jr. and Taryn Manning. So I I found even down to the wire with some of, you know, ostensibly the smaller characters in it, it, we just had a lot of luck because, you know, I feel like it becomes cross communicative with actors that they say, wow, if that person's doing that, like this would be a good opportunity to go out and explore and and play together. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the visual that all of these um, actors and actresses bring to the movie. Um, Taryn Manning and and um, Boone Jr. from uh, you know Sons of Anarchy. There's just these, yeah. these unmistakable. They're they're on the screen, and you're like, wow. They're. I mean, just their image kind of creates a tone. 
in the film. And um, that's, that, that's yeah. what was so fun about these characters. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think, you know, certainly when you're dealing with an actor like uh, who has such an amazing legacy, like Bruce Stern, I think, you know, you, you're bringing up a super interesting point because I was kind of hyper aware of just the, the history of who these actors are on screen. And you have to take that in, into some consideration in telling a story, especially in noir, because we all walk in with our preconceived ideas of who they are um, or what we're used to seeing them playing. And obviously actors are, are meant to be chameleons in terms of they should be able to shift faces and personas and guises. Um, but, you know, it made it easier, I guess, in the casting, because like with someone like Dern, he spent so much time in the 70s kind of addressing social issues about the Vietnam era, you know, everything uh, that was at root and at stake in the country politically at that point. And, and that, you know, certainly became a huge bedrock for what his character is here in, in this film specifically. Yeah. Bruce Dern was an interesting choice. Um, you know, my frame of reference for him is Big Love and the kind of the creepy dad or the creepy you know, grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was expecting a little more, um, a villainous, uh, character in Bruce Dern. Mm -hmm. Um, but he turned out to be, well, I don't want to give anything away, but it was, it was fun to see him on screen and the role that he played and what he contributed to the story. Um, so I saw three screenwriters, um, and then story by for one of them on this project how involved yeah. were you in the actual um, finalizing of this screenplay before it was shot? I mean, you know, like we were saying earlier on, um, Alex, who is the original screenwriter and has the story by credit, um, you know, basically delivered up the blueprint for the story. Uh, you know, to be honest, in order to relate to it and understand it, it kind of the window in terms of what I was looking to try and say in this, you know, I ended up basically rewriting about, I'd say, a good half of the script in terms of like Frank Grillo's character didn't exist in the original. Uh, and there was just a lot of nuances about backstory, dialogue stuff that, you know, just kind of at least allowed me to see how it fused, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, by, by the end of it, I, I think it's a super fortunate uh, version of, of synchronicity and, and harmony because I think Alex is, is quite pleased with the finished result and, you know, ultimately filmmaking is a totally collaborative effort. So it's like, you know, things are changing throughout the process of filming and that there's dialogue in there that, you know, we ad libbed and improvised day of that you know, made the final picture. So, you know, I, I think it's important to not be hyper sacred to what's on the, the written page and know that it's a dynamic that can change, you know, as you bring in all these other human components. You know, one of my favorite things about this film is, um, number one, it's a really tight story. So there's really nothing on screen that's unnecessary. Gets right to the mm -hmm. point. Um, but second, the music was fantastic. Um, and specifically, oh, you. you know, the, the, the soundtrack, the songs. I, I don't know how that came together, but for me, it felt almost inspired by Jackie Brown, um, or, or <laughs> totally. uh, you know, the, the Quentin, is that the name of the movie? The Quentin Tarantino film? Yeah. Jackie Brown. Yeah. yeah Tarantino. He, he's super, uh, you know, in, uh, infuses everything with a ton of music. You know? Yeah. And, and just, you know, when, when Shea Wiggum's character Parker gets into the car and turns on <laughs> this, the, uh, turns on the vehicle and it's this old, you know, classic, I, I forget what kind of vehicle it is, but, you know, it, it just has this seventies vibe to it, even though I think it was set yeah. in the nineties or something, but, or, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, that's a mid nineties car that it, it could be a sleeper for like a, a mid seventies car, you know? Right. Yeah. Like almost like a, like an old, um, Cadillac or something like that, but the music totally. that is accompanied by him and his iconic, yeah. his iconic, uh, face, it was just a, a great choice to pick these songs. And I don't know where they came from. I didn't recognize the songs, but they sounded yeah. like they were from a different era. Well, my, um, our, our music supervisor, Alex Brown, I mean, she's just somebody who really, uh, she's like a musicologist. So it's like, if you say you're interested in like a seventies track, that's like Al Green, she'll, she'll basically be able to find five or six songs that slept, got swept under the carpet or were just never as popular along the way. Um, so, you know, we spent a long, long time just trying to audition different songs throughout it. And a lot of it, 
um, I was using even when I wrote the script, you know, did all, all the rewriting on it because it, it just, for whatever reason, very uh, important tonally for me to understand, you know, kind of the mood and, and, you know, when you're not operating with the visuals at that stage, just, you know, kind of what, what the overall ambiance is going to be like. So mm -hmm. we, uh, we definitely went to town with all that music and not always the easiest balance, you know, kind of uh, working with existing needle drop because it can combat against score. And so, you know, some of it was designed to be set pieces and other ones, you know, we just had to kind of massage our way through it, see how it was, how it was going to play out. I know that uh, you got your start in, in the arts, from what I can tell with quintessence films yeah. and shooting music. And I watched your video for uh, Lou Reed's ecstasy. And um, I know you've done uh -huh. a lot of music videos and commercial work, but tell us how you found um, you know, the visual arts and, and, um, film and commercials and, and music, uh, videos specifically. Uh, it's a, a, a real good question, Brian. Cause you know, like, like I was saying just now, it's like the music is, it's very seminal for me in terms of the creative process. And, you know, I did cut my teeth on shooting a, a bunch of music videos early on. And so, and, you know, I always find that with music videos, you're always creating the visual component, like the libretto that goes with that actual piece. But, you know, in commercial filmmaking, you, you basically have the opportunity to experiment a lot. So it's like, you know, the, the beauty of what that offers is, it is that fusion of art and commerce that you learn how to work with clients, whether it's an ad agency, whether it's a record label, and specifically the, the musicians themselves when they're, they're creating stuff. And I always felt like you were helping to foster their vision of what, what the music was. And, you know, filmmaking is very similar in the sense when you, when you make a film, you know, you are encountering the integrity that the actors bring or just managing, you know, the uh, production kind of cycle uh, with producers plus like eventually like the studio, like trying to, to launch a film. So yeah, it becomes just a gigantic learning curve ultimately, you know, that in some ways, uh, I, I like to consider it applied field theory that you can apply those lessons to the next one. And um, in filmmaking or making films, that is, it, it's so vital that you you really just tone in all of your attention on the performances because it, it's an actor's medium ultimately. You know, right. that's that's what that's our window into a story. When in your life were you called to uh, visual arts and film? At what age? When I when I, when I was about. Uh, 14 i uh i started taking a lot of pictures and uh it sounds kind of funny my dad was like a spaghetti western junkie because he, he's from italy and so in that era like that was kind of the equivalent of the big blockbuster kind of fair um and i never really watched what i would consider today art films you know and so i like came across stanley kubrick's paths of glory and then um some of the fellini films and i was like well i kind of imagine the world in these kinds of ways or like you know when i dream and 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 think creatively um i see things in a certain way and what was amazing is i just never connected oh yeah there's somebody behind those things <laughs> there were just things that were on the tv or the screen and so you know it, it really uh, spurred something that i said i've got to figure out exactly how you become one of the storytellers you know yeah and how did you i mean what were your steps to become a visual storyteller uh i mean it certainly it, taking photos constantly throughout that period. And then um, I, I basically dug in and started writing a lot, then. whether it was short stories, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, concepts for films. Um, and then from there, I spent the last two years of university at film school. I, I was pretty lucky. I, I, I applied once, didn't get in. And then I, I was lucky enough to write a commercial for a photographer that was actually on MTV and that, that was the basis of how I got into school. And from there, it, it kind of seemed apparent, like, you know, you're, you're learning the craft at a, a film school in terms of you understand a bit about screenwriting, cameras, directing, uh, how to build sets and all that kind of stuff. But it, it was apparent it was not easy to go to work directing or produce stuff out of school. So I basically kind of honed in on, on commercial filmmaking because mm -hmm. um, at that time there was a lot of really inspiring folks making making work. You know, a lot, a lot of the generation of the great directors today, whether it's a David Fincher, or a Mark Romanek, a Spike Jones, and uh, you know, it, it, it seemed like it, it was the window. So I, I kind of really just uh, started doing that, and you know, obviously here we are, twenty five years later. So it, right. it takes, takes a while to get to all, all these things to align. 
So you're you're in commercial filmmaking and making music videos, and then you make this transition into feature films. How difficult was it in terms of networking, um, technical savvy, and just opportunities to find your way into uh, feature filmmaking and narrative filmmaking? I mean, it's it, uh, um, a gargantuan Sisyphusian pussy in proposition. So you're, you know, you're always pushing that boulder up the hill and hoping it doesn't roll over you again. Right. Um, I had a film I wrote in 2003. It was financed like three or four times over. Um, it was a complicated piece of material called Coin Locker Babies, which is like a Japanese sci-fi, basically. Right. Um, and you know, it takes so much to really have everything line up. It's like we, we had a very good cast for that film, and it, like ultimately fell apart because of the 08 uh, fiscal crisis. It was oh, yeah. basically banks were no longer willing to like lend against distribution deals. And so, you know, in many ways I've been writing films. I've written probably about four or five that have been picked up along the way for, for like studios and stuff. But in terms of actually getting all the pieces together to, to actually be on the ground shooting, it's, it's been difficult. I got to say, you know, so a lot of, a lot of fate, fortune and luck, I think along the way. What have you know? Th- this appears to be, I think, your first uh, major feature film, um, n- narrative film, where you have this pretty remarkable cast. You've got a great storyline, and there's just it- it's a really exciting film. Um, where do you see your career going next, and how important is a film like this to launch you into the next stage of your career? Um, you know, I, I think <sighs> filmmaking is it, it's a complex, complex proposition. I like to believe it's cumulative and, you know, that, um, one piece of work will contribute and lead to your next one. And then there is a certain degree of it being flavor of the, the month kind of club in terms of, you know, if people are, are enjoying something you're doing, then you're relevant to, uh, to go forward. I, I've always thought about directing kind of like a, uh, it's a contender's game. Like you, you just have to last enough rounds, and if you can make it to the end, eventually you'll be dignified to stand on your feet, and and great stuff will come along the way. You'll get you get your shots in. Um, I, I'm hoping this will, you know, uh, lead the way for a few things I have kind of in the works. So, um, you know, in an, an exciting time in the world, uh, not vis-a-vis the pandemic and all the world suffering, but the way that we're ingesting media these days. There's just a lot more. Uh, folks really taking risks with unique content, uh, you know, in the streaming landscape, whether it's the Amazon, the uh, Netflix, the HBO. So I, I think it's a unique moment because you're not uh, confined strictly to the two hour format anymore. You can kind of have a lot more wiggle room to, you know, create an episodic movie, for example. So there's been some great stuff in these last few years that kind of switched the formula, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, episodic television seems to have become, um, I don't know, more esteemed these days than, than f- feature films. Um, and there's yeah. so much, there's this, it seems like f- from a creator standpoint, there's so many opportunities that weren't there 10 years ago that are here today in terms of where you can create the platforms that are willing to, to fund it. And, um, it seems, I mean, from the, from the outside looking in, it seems overwhelming, like the choices that you have and the directions that you can go um, as a filmmaker and as a creator. Um, but yeah, are, no, uh, I think that's right. It, it's overwhelming, but it's also a new Wild West. And I, I think these uh, hierarchies, if you want to call them, that, they, they do shift every 15 years. You know, so like there was the era of the mini majors that, you know, kind of allowed certain types of auteurs to make films and uh, you know, that, that it's kind of the devil in the detail of, of being a visual artist in, in this medium, because you, you do have to have a, a keen understanding or at least an awareness of what's going on in, in terms of the business side of stuff. And, and it's definitely a constant. You have to design with that in mind. Have you found that with the sea of content that we're swimming in now, that it's harder to be seen and heard, even when you have a feature film like this with just so many amazing actors and characters and a great storyline um that 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 today might be the most challenging time in the history of, of film and television uh to actually have your work be seen 
Welcome to the megalopoly, my friend. I, I think, you know, <laughs> be careful with the, the Tower of Babel we're, we're building at this point. I mean, digital information has changed everything for the better, but with it comes consequences. So I, I like to believe that if somebody creates something that, you know, has some sort of profound message or something that's human enough that we connect to it, it, it will be discovered or at least find some notoriety now and it will have posterity moving forward. Uh, however, it, it is kind of like a needle in the haystack sort of proposition. It's actually, you know, if you miss it for that one week, it's like a blitzkrieg of information of well, what's next. Oh, did you watch that new show that's on? And, you know, it's so different to document than old, old school days where you'd go to that great video store or even that record store for that matter that, you know, you knew more or less what was there. It was ta- tactile and there was a culture of people, uh, you know, really actively discussing that, which, you know, happens. But I just think it, it, the antenna rod is less and less honed in in one direction these days, you know? Yeah. Now, did I read this correctly that this was shot in Virginia? Yeah, that's correct. We, we filmed it in Norfolk, Virginia, which is uh, kind of an aggregate of, of townships. So Virginia Beach is there, Portsmouth, and uh, Hampton Roads. And what went into the decision-making process for that location? So, you know, uh, the original story was set to place, take place in Chicago. Um, when I switched it to St. Louis, you know, it, it basically became a question of, you know, which states are the most film centrically friendly. So, you know, obviously Atlanta is a huge hub for production these days as is uh, rally in North Carolina. Um, and our producer actually had filmed uh, two other films in this area. So uh, they, they kind of knew the lay of the land there and just in many ways, just kind of what the community was willing to, to offer up in terms of helping us to film down there, which, which was vital you know, for someone like this, you know, to, close down streets for like gunfights at all hours of the night and you can do that except it has a serious price tag certain places but like to shoot this movie in new york would have been prohibitively complicated for example yeah so there's a lot of logistics that went into it not necessarily the aesthetics of the town but you know the tax incentives and always yeah, yeah. huh that's fascinating but, you know with that in mind it's like the, uh, they'd film their previous film in this town, the, the producers, and they actually shot two days of Paris in the same area because, you know, like logistically it can be hard to bring your actors. And so, you know, it's always a bit of compromise, but it's amazing how industrious production designers and, and the artisans can be these days in terms of really making something kind of uh, speak to the attributes of another place, another city. And in this case, we, we researched St. Louis enough, you know, that we knew more or less that there were ubiquitous qualities with, with filming in Virginia. Right. And it looks like um, you you shot this just in the nick of time before with the pandemic kit. <laughs> Tell me about it. So when did it wrap? Uh, we wrapped in the summer of uh, 19. So we, okay. we basically did most of the post-production work throughout the fall. And we're kind of at the end of the pipeline of all that, like doing sound mixing and all that stuff, literally when the uh, the pandemic started like rearing its ugly face all over the world. Yeah. And so you, you're sitting on this film and Oof. I mean, what was it, was the delay in release related entirely to uh, the pandemic and theaters being closed or a hundred percent. Well, yeah. it, it, the whole concept of release patterns, supply and demand chain, like no different than the supermarkets was disrupted with, you know, so films were half finished films were ready to be screened and, the theaters obviously closed and you know for this film just because the way the producers kind of uh organized the financing and, and the kind of creative machinations of how they wanted to play it they always intended to bring it to a festival as a birthplace so you know our, our hope was to bring it to Cannes or venice or a toronto uh, but all that stuff was canceled that year so it was definitely a period of like sitting in a hot seat, just being like, you know, what, what are we going to do with this? And now so much time has passed. It actually feels like it's uh, an amazing dream come true to actually uh, just have everything align at this one moment where it feels like, you know, life is coming back to, to everywhere, you know, to everything we do in this country on a daily basis. Yeah. Looking back on what I was doing when you guys were mixing sound and in post-production, I, I was at Sundance in 2020 and it's funny. I, yeah. I rode in the same elevator with Shay um, because we were staying in the same building on main street. And, right. um, and so at, at this time he had just looking back on it, he had just shot this 
this film and was probably anticipating it being released that year and and uh look where that's we are right now. I, I think he was there with the the quarry or something year um, yeah he'd finished a couple things and yeah i mean talk about someone uh having cabin fever i mean he, he had so many different things lined up because he's, he's just wrapped mission impossible the next two of them in the last like week or so mm-hmm. so you know like everybody like had their plans going forward and it, it, it derailed everything and hopefully it made us wiser and more patient and uh you know just kind of assess really what what we all want to be doing moving forward i think right as a creator, are you looking in the near and midterm at projects that are more contained for logistical purposes and, you know, COVID issues? I'm, it, it's definitely something you have to uh, take into serious consideration. But, uh, you know, depending upon the scale and the budget these days, I mean, so much of the safety precautions for the pandemic have been really factored in uh, as line items. So it's like no different than you used to have to pay out a certain percentage for contingency and insurance. Like now all that, those costs are factored in up front. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would like to think it's not going to limit, you know, the, the types of stories we tell too much, but you know, maybe I'll focus on doing stuff outside for a while or something. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe a remake of my dinner with Andre or something like that. Where you're just... <laughs> I, you, I love that film. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. Just a small cast ensemble. And I, I had a friend who did something like that. There were one of the few films that shot the beginning of the pandemic. And that was the only way to do it. Just encloister yourself, a few people, cast members, and, and just keep it really safe. as you're working. Right. So um, back to the film briefly, um, Olivia Munn. When did mm-hmm. she come into, when, when did she get attached to the film relative to um, Dern and Wiggum and, and Grillo? Uh, Olivia was the second actress who uh, actually got involved. And, you know, she was so seminal, I, I think, it, in creating that balance, because ultimately we were lucky that they're, they're the two leads of the film. And uh, it, it really, it articulated a lot of what the world could look like at that point in terms of the, the rest of the cast. And, and you know, mm-hmm. she, she was just so generous in terms of what she brought into it so early on. I mean, she was constantly giving back to other actors on set and, and just pulling from the right cloth, I think, in, in terms of what she brought to the character. I mean, she, she personalized it to her own experience as a child. And uh, it just felt like there was a, a lot of common ground for, you know, where where her character, Dahlia, ultimately uh, ends up, you know. Uh, yeah. she, 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 she found the inside to get into that and, ma- and make it real. Yes. I think there's a lot of, um, uh, pre preconceived notions about actors and actresses that are, um, I don't know, they're just sort of larger than life in other roles, um, or mm-hmm. their roles are so different than what she was playing here that maybe you go in a little bit skeptical about whether they can pull it off, whether whether they were the right fit, but she yeah. did a great job, uh, very credible performance of someone in you know a social economic place that you would not expect someone like Olivia to be playing. Um, yeah, and um, and her you know her life experience is is a lot different than you would expect, and maybe that's just my my bad as a an audience member for you know, imposing or, or projecting that on her. But, yeah. um, I was well, we, really, we all do uh, that, you know? Yeah. I, I was very pleasantly surprised with, uh, with her performance. Uh, not because I, I don't think she's a great actress. I just, for some reason, I pigeonhole people into oh, certain absolutely. types of roles, but yeah, I, th- I think, you know, it's something that really is the nature of, uh, the image factory, so to speak. So, you know, if you see someone who does enough, you know, Marvel or big budget fair kind of action stuff and, or is more, comedically driven it takes a while to really uh, kind of reassess what they might be as not like someone like steve carell comes to mind only like you know like did little miss sunshine which is offbeat and i'm, I'm a big big fan of fox catcher um the mm. uh, charles dupont story and you know that that was kind of the first time he played really serious dramatic um and you know i, I think after you see one of those roles you kind of re-identify with the actor you say oh wow he can also do this and so they're no longer pigeonholed as like you know the the, the comic kind of character right but, that's a great example of steve carell yeah no him and uh, you know jim carrey and i think we're at an amazing moment with a lot of these actors that you know if given the opportunities and their 
brave enough to to do it. I, I think they can go to places that are not always easy or comfortable, you know. And I think in Olivia's case, you know, definitely there was uh, a certain uh, pre expectation in terms of the kind of work she's she's done before. But I, I, I think she's so brilliant in this dramatically. I think you really you, you see someone who's palpable and real on screen. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we have a few minutes left and I want to make sure I get in this, this last question. Um, yeah, please let's, let's do. So I've, I've talked to a lot of artists recently about advice that they have for young people that want to get into their creative space and in, in your case, um, film. And it seems that that advice has evolved over time because of where we, you know, where we are in terms of being able to produce your own content. So you have people yeah. on TikTok and YouTube that are producing with their phones um, high quality content that's getting a lot of eyeballs, a lot of views, and yep. and then you have the traditional route of well, you move to LA and then you become an intern and then a production assistant, and then a writer's right assistant. Cycle, yeah, yeah. So what what is, advice do you have for young people, or even not young people, but just people that want to get into this creative space? to start becoming a visual storyteller like you? Uh, you, you lay that out so beautifully, Brian, because I, I, I think what's changed, you know, at least in terms of filmmaking, since, since I started doing this, it was like you needed to have access to the equipment. You know, you needed to be able to go onto a scene back and then invent the digital editing and you needed to have access to these cameras that cost a, a ton of money and to the point that I know when Werner Herzog filmed, I think it was a gear or one of his earlier movies, he, he actually stole a camera and he's like, I, I preordained this because God wants me to have this and I'm going to be a filmmaker. And like, that, it's like, I'm going to take these tools and be able to do it. Um, right now, like I, I don't think anyone has an excuse because you can shoot amazingly uh, high quality images, you know, on your phone. And uh, so the tools are there to experiment and to, to really creating it's about just putting yourself out there and constantly exploring and doing more and um, in many ways just being aware of, of what's out there in the world also so if you, you want to be a filmmaker go to as many museums as you can read as many books as you can listen to as much music as you can and, and live your life and try and transcribe that into uh, the storytelling you know because uh, it's a hierarchy uh out here in terms of what works uh, if, if you want to go more traditional routes, but you know, you'll probably end up with more traditional results if you go that way as well. Mm. Mm. So I, I think it's, it's really important just to, to, uh, you know, not to sound cliche, like live a bit of an unexamined life in terms of what your life will come first and then the art or work comes with that. You know? Yeah. So get out there, live your life, do as many things, do as many things as you can to, provide experiences to inform your art, mm -hmm. um, yes, create. Uh, but what about film school? Um, how important was film school for you and how important is it today? That, that's it's something I, I've looked back at a bunch over the years. And for me, the great takeaway beyond, you know, learning the technical basics of what, how you create stories from, from with equipment the editing process, all the, all the stuff that's a little bit easier to actually understand and, uh, you know, beyond like an amateurist hobby uh, perspective these days, you need a core group of individuals there. And this is the other thing I, I did want to touch on is like your community as a storyteller or an artist becomes so vital because you not only reinforce each other, you push each other. Um, and it, it's always amazing to me when I look back now, going on almost 25 years since since I finished up school, uh, just how many incredible things these other friends have done over the years, you know, whether they're cinematographers, whether they became production designers or writers. And it wasn't always apparent at the beginning, you know, because we were all kind of walking our path and maybe one person gets there a lot quicker within five years, or 10 years. Uh, but in that interfacing and keep finding your tribe, you know, the people that you mm. really uh, exchange information with, uh, that that is vital to this. And I, I think that applies, you know, in every aspect of it, um, even in the, the corporate stuff and you know, having to find money and figuring that all like you, you exchange information along the way and then you help each other. Yeah. I like that. Find your tribe. Uh, very yeah. well said. <laughs> Michele Giveta, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and, um, really looking forward to seeing the response to this wonderful film, the gateway. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. It was wonderful talking together. 
And uh, I'm, I'm wishing you a great rest of the summer. All right. You too. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favorite ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.